Well, an official good morning to everyone. If you are um, west of Iowa, if you are in the central time zone or the eastern, it's a good afternoon. My name is Megan Barrett and I'm the director of the Iowa Quilt Museum and I'm so happy to be online again for our virtual Iowa Quilt Scape. Uh, just about two weeks ago, we opened a brand new exhibit here at the Iowa Quilt Museum. And it's um, an, an exhibit in two parts, really. Um, but the first part is titled 40 by 40 at 40. And all of the quilts in this exhibit were provided to us by members of the Manhattan Quilt Guild. And so today I'm joined by three of those members, um, Victoria Finley-Wolf, who's coming to us from Long Island, and Beth Carney, who is in Yonkers in the city, and Teresa Barkley, who goes by McLaughlin when she's working, but Teresa Barkley when she's quilting, she's told me. And I didn't ask where you're at today, Teresa. Well, I'm usually in New Jersey or New York, but today I'm in Delaware at my mom's house. Ah, uh, very good. Working remotely, it sounds like. <laughs> very good. So let me just tell you a tiny bit about the Iowa Quilt Museum for those of you who are unfamiliar with our organization. We are located in Winterset, Iowa, which is just southwest of Des Moines, our capital city. And we are a lovely little town of about 5,000 um, residents in Madison County. And if you're familiar with the bridges of Madison County book, movie, musical, that's us. Um, we are also the birthplace of the actor John Wayne and, of course, the home of the Iowa Quilt Museum. We opened in this location in 2016. And we exhibit a variety of quilts. Um, sometimes our exhibits are more historic in nature, a traditional patchwork. Sometimes they're more of a modern nature or, in this case, contemporary art quilts. And we're so pleased to be exhibiting this display by the Manhattan Quilt Guild titled 40 by 40 at 40. So as I'm explaining this to visitors, I tell them that these are 40 inch by 40 inch wall quilts. They were made specifically for hanging as artwork as opposed to bed quilts, and they are in honor and celebration of the Manhattan Quilt Guild's 40th anniversary. So, Teresa, could you tell us a little bit more about how this exhibit came to be, the, um, how the idea was born within the Manhattan Quilt Guild, and maybe just tell us a little bit about the guild itself? Well, the guild obviously started in 1980, uh, and we're we started this exhibition in uh, 2020 to celebrate our 40th anniversary. The Guild began with an advertisement in Quilter's Newsletter magazine by our founding member, Karen Birkenfeld, who was looking for other like-minded people to join her around the dining room table and work on their projects and discuss what was happening in quilting at the time. And uh, it grew to be a group that's usually around 20 members. And uh, we've always met in a kind of small space and tried to keep the number around 20, 25 members. And over the years, it's progressed from being uh, a combination of um, traditional quilt makers to more of an emphasis on art quilts. And many years ago, I can't remember exactly when, um, we decided we would start doing a traveling exhibit where each member would make a 36 inch square quilt uh, based on a particular theme, usually with some reference to New York. And uh, it always took us a long time to decide on what the theme would be and what the title would be. And we did this five times. Um, I joined the Guild in 91. So over that period of time from 91 until uh, 2019, we had five traveling exhibits with different themes. And we decided for our 40th anniversary, it would be interesting to just focus on the signature style of each of our members. Instead of trying to make a New York connection, make it about how individual each of us is in, in our approach to quilting. So instead of 36 inches, we each made a quilt 40 inches by 40 inches, um, hence the name. And we've always had a difficult time choosing a name. So this name kind of wrote itself. So. Um, that's how uh, this particular exhibition came to be. And thankfully, you invited us to include additional quilts to fill out the space that you had available. So it's terrific that you've got additional work as well. Yeah, great segue. So I mentioned that this exhibit is in a bit two parts. So there are 19 of the 40 by 40 quilts. 
And while our museum is not large, we have just one main gallery. And so it typically, we have space for about 25 bed-sized quilts. And so 19 quilts wasn't quite enough to fill our gallery. And so several of the artists from your group graciously agreed to provide additional works. Um, and the whole layout is just, is just really beautiful. Um, we're very, very pleased with how it, um, we've said many times, we can't make this space unattractive um, but it's it's especially wonderful with these particular quilts in it. So, um, thank you. <laughs> yes. Oh, you were talking about the names of your exhibits. I think the my favorite one as I was looking through your past exhibits was the Metro Textural. I thought that was so clever. I loved that, and I I assume that it had to do <clears throat> with different texture te texture type techniques in art quilting. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Very good. There was there was an emphasis on the quilting, which is frequently not focused on. Oh, um, sure. The essay for the catalog focused on how the quilts had uh, a multitude of different textures, both from the materials used and the type of quilting done. A lot of times we focus on the surface design and not the the quilting texture. Mm -hmm. Beth, were you going to add something? Well, I was just going to say that that it took us a long time to get to that text uh, that title. And we're a very democratic type of group. And so literally we would come to meetings and everybody would have names and we would vote on them and then they'd come up with nothing. So we were quite pleased when we got that name too. <laughs> quite pleased. Sure, so I've just put um, the Manhattan Quilters Guild website into the chat window. Um, so you, if you, any of you who are watching want to learn more about the guild you can go to their website and there are photos of past exhibits there um, as well it's since we're speaking of the chat window please feel free to use the chat window if you want to comment or ask questions um, i will keep watching that as we go through a discussion and then i will interject those as we have the opportunity and we will definitely leave a time for question and answer at the end so today we want to sp focus specifically on the six quilts in the exhibit that were made by Teresa and Beth and Victoria. And I will show photos of their quilts in a little bit, but I thought we would start just by doing some introductions um, by each of the artists of who they are, where they are, how they got into quilting, um, kind of what is their signature style since this exhibit is based upon um, highlighting the signature style. So Victoria, could I nominate you to go first? Sure. So I'm Victoria Finley Wolf and I'm not quite the newest member. I think Rachel's the newest member to the group. Um, I think I've been in the group five or six years. I can't even remember what uh, year that I started, but I would think it was right after that Metro textural exhibit that the group had. Um, and was friends with Paula Nadelstern and, and there had started being conversations about, you should come to our group, you, you're doing something different. And I, I stayed back for a while because I was traveling and working so much, um, but then I was just so honored to be asked and I'm thrilled to be a part of the Manhattan Quilters Guild. Um, I started quilting at a very young age. Both of my parents were, um, my father had an upholstery business and my mother sewed for Finger Hut. So there was a lot of sewing going on in our house, including the quilts that we slept underneath, which were made by my grandmother, uh, Elda Wolf, and she made double knit polyester quilts. So some of you are familiar with um, my connection and what I do as far as uh, the traditional aspect um, and then taking it to a more modern or updated approach. Um, everything I've done is, is based off the, the sort of crazy patchwork that my grandmother did. And that's kind of where my work has started from taking piles of nothing, sewing it together to make something. And then oftentimes cutting that apart and then adding layers and building it into a whole nother quilt. Sometimes that's a double wedding ring, made a few of those. I actually had an exhibition at uh, the Iowa Quilt Museum uh, early when they started, when they opened. And um, of my double wedding rings, and a bunch of early work, sort of a, a retrospect sort of uh, collection of pieces. And when I came to um, the Manhattan Quilters Guild, I think my double wedding ring book had just come out and I was very immersed in exploring 
um, probably 20 double wedding rings around that time, but I've made over 70 double wedding rings now. I live in New York City. Well, I did. I moved out to my house uh, since COVID and quarantine uh, on Long Island, which is where I run my business from. I have vfwquilts.com. So I'm working from home and I'm sewing from home and trying to get outside and enjoy the weather. And that's kind of who I am. Do we want to go on to the next? Yeah, let's pass things over to Beth. <laughs> okay, well, um, I am from New York. I got into quilting because my mother was a sewer and she was actually the second graduating class of the Fashion Institute of Technology. So our mantra in the house was, don't buy it, I can make it cheaper. Um, so when we had friends that moved up to Boston and bought this beautiful log cabin quilt that had the clamshell quilting, I really wanted it. And of course I couldn't afford it. So I said, I'll make it. So um, I say that I started in 1973, which was when I get married, got married and my husband didn't realize it, but we spent our honeymoon going from quilt shop to quilt shop and fabric store to fabric store to buy. I was gonna make a log cabin. I knew nothing. It took seven years. My second quilt uh, was a carpenter wheel. I made it from a museum. My math was off. It was supposed to be a baby quilt. Turned out to be a queen size quilt that took 12 years and my daughter never got it. And eventually I guess she will. Um, I did traditional quilting up until about 2001 and I enjoyed it, but I really wanted to go further. So I studied with Nancy Crow. And she is the one that gave me the tools uh, to work in an improv improvisational way to create abstract quilts. The thing that touched me the most is my background is a dancer. So I danced semi-professionally in the city. I choreograph, I teach, um, and it's all about improvisation. So when I look at, so, when I started to study with Nancy, it was about combining performing arts, which is something that you see and then it disappears, except it's left in your memory or it's left in the wind with visual arts where you have something concrete. So that's how I began in quilting. Um, I've done three series. The first one is called Structured Chaos, which is basically what it is. I used as much fabric, all my hand dyes, um, I started dyeing fabric. Um, and I made fabrics, I made patterns, and then I tried to put them into some kind of structure that made sense. Um, the more color, the more texture, the better. My second series is called Chasms, which began as, the structured chaos was more about space and time and energy. Structured chaos became a, um, personal exploration of the gap that was created by the loss of my mother. Um, and this series began to take the cuts in the fabric and the lines and to explore them deeper or above. Um, anyway, I recently retired from dance and my third series is called Movement, which is at the museum. And that's an ode to my love of dance, which has been a part of my life for about 45 years. And it's the search for the essential line of movement that says it all. So I found in my new work that less is more, and I've got piles and piles of anti-fabric that I still haven't used. Um, I begin by sketching and playing on the design wall with gestures that imply simple dance movements. And sometimes the figures look very literal and sometimes they don't. Um, do you want me to talk about movement three or do you want to wait till the picture is there? Let's wait and we'll go back to the pictures in a little bit, okay? So that's basically my, who I am. I love quilting. Color. All right, let's pass things over to Teresa to tell us a little bit more about herself. Well, <clears throat> I got interested in sewing at a very young age. My mom taught me to sew when I was five. Uh, I remember it very distinctly because my sister had started first grade and I was very bored. 
and my mom uh, was starting to make a quilt herself around that time. And she taught me uh, how to do some hand sewing. I wasn't allowed on the machine for a while, but uh, I became aware that in the house we had two quilts that my great grandmother had made. And fortunately I'm at my mom's house today so I can show one of them to you. Um, this grandmother's flower garden quilt was something that my mom shared with me at a very young age and she explained the concept of heirloom to me. And being the second oldest, I got the idea in my head that my older sister would get this someday and if I wanted one, I'd have to make my own. So one of the first things I did was try to copy this and I used every fabric in the house, corduroys, voils, all kinds of things. I never finished it. But the, the quilt that my mom was making was just rectangles of fabric. And uh, I started and finished one like this without too much difficulty um, making wiser fabric choices. And I think that, um, my fascination with fitting fabric together was one of the reasons that I became a professional pattern maker. I've worked in New York in the garment industry for over 40 years, and it was a desire to learn how to make paper patterns to fit together shapes the way I wanted uh, that I think led me to that career. And it's been a good compliment. Um, I use a lot of the same tools and a lot of the same techniques, but when I quilt, I can do whatever I want, use whatever fabric I want, whatever size I want, spend as much time as I want. And uh, it's two dimensional instead of three dimensional, instead of trying to fit a model, I'm trying to create the design that I want. So um, I've always done the two side by side. And um, consequently, I'm not as productive as I would like to be. I have many more plans than <laughs> I have uh, you know, time to make, but um, the... Uh, the style that I'm most known for, I think, is, is a stamp series. And we can talk more, of that, more about that when, when we get to the example that's in the exhibit. But um, one feature that is common to almost all of my work is the use of found object materials. I really enjoy taking vintage textiles of all types and combining them with contemporary material to create some kind of composition on a theme. Like I'll collect handkerchiefs, pillow tops, uh, flour sacks, feed sacks, sugar sacks, uh, advertising on fabric, um, things like that. So Teresa, let's just go ahead and go to your first quilt then. What a wonderful segue. Okay. So well, the quilt, this, the this 40 by 40 quilt here um, that's pictured on your screen is called Dreams. And it started with um, my finding this, flower, this uh, cornmeal sack that's in the center with a falcon on it. I'm always looking for uh, fabric textiles with interesting graphics on. And when I saw this available uh, on eBay, I thought immediately about the movie, The Maltese Falcon and thought, oh, maybe someday I'll do a quilt that makes some connection to the, to the movie Maltese Falcon, which was a favorite movie when I was a child. And uh, I started thinking I'm going to collect fabric with blackbirds and gemstones on to combine with this sack. And like most of my projects, it takes many, many years to assemble the materials that ultimately come together to make the quilt. Um, in the movie, if you're not familiar with the movie, there are characters in the movie that are looking for this blackbird statue. Uh, that's very old and they believe that under this plain black exterior, there are gems and it's very precious and people all over the world are looking for this thing. And uh, so my idea was to make a comparison between um, well, I have forgotten to mention Humphrey Bogart's best line in the movie. Um, people at, at the conclusion of the movie, someone asks him, why is everybody after this statue? They, they finally find a statue and they realize it's not the real one. And so the pursuit continues for the real statue. And a character asks Humphrey Bogart, who's a detective or a private eye, 
why is everybody after this? What is it made of? And he said, it's the stuff that dreams are made of. And this is an often repeated line um, parodied. And I started thinking in the year that I was making this uh, 2019 about the Dream Act and the American Dream and thought to make a parallel between all of the nations that together make up our nation being like gems set into a piece of jewelry, like these stones were supposedly set into the Maltese Falcon. And the little flags that you see around the central medallion on the quilt, they're cigarette silks. And these were little pieces of cloth that were offered as a premium when you bought cigarettes. There were also images put on flannel with cigars, cigar packages. And the concept was to entice women to buy cigarettes. This was around 1912 or so. And the idea was you would see these and they were different on different packages and you would buy often to be able to assemble enough to make a quilt or a pillow top. And flags were a popular design. There were also butterflies and uh, national costumes. But I thought that these, um, as I started applying them around the American flag at the center of the quilt, I realized it looked like a piece of jewelry and it made me think about generations of immigrants are what makes our country so, so special. So it's a combination of the statue being the stuff that dreams are made of and the American dream and the dream act, which um, hopefully will bring citizenship to more people. So you mentioned, Teresa, that the falcon, the feed sack in the center was something you purchased on eBay. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine you have quite a few connections being in the, the garment district yourself, but how did you come across the cigarette silks? Because that's a question I fielded several times already. <laughs> well, um, I come from a family of collectors um, <laughs> and uh, my parents for a period of many years went to auctions on a regular basis and, and sought the things that they were interested in collecting. And my dad knew the kind of thing that I like to collect. And we used to go to uh, antique stores, antique malls in Pennsylvania, often together on weekends when we would visit. And he knew the kind of thing that I was interested in collecting. And he saw what I used in my quilts. And he bought a pillow top at an auction um, near his home um, that included all of these sacks, uh, all of these little um, flag motifs sewn edge to edge to make a pillow top. And it, uh, it was painstaking work, but I un unsewed them all. They were very badly sewn and it um, took a long time to, to separate them because the, the way they were stitched was really tiny stitches. And I didn't want to bend back any of the edges because I was going to lose some of the text. Um, there's tiny, tiny printing underneath the flag that identifies, um, the, in some cases, the manufacturer and each of them has a country name on it. And some are countries that don't exist anymore. And some are uh, flags that have, the country exists, but the flag has changed dramatically for that country. So it's, it's very interesting. Uh, Historical, historical artifact, I think. Yeah, certainly. Shall we look at your next quilt? Okay. This is an example, the quilt is called Time is Money. And it's an example of one of the quilts in the stamp series. Um, all of the quilts in this series have this scallop border uh, to resemble the perforation on a stamp. And they're never exactly copies of a stamp, but sometimes they take their inspiration from a stamp or uh, maybe not the design from the stamp, but a theme from a stamp. And this quilt is modeled after the first airmail stamp, which was, um, let me check my notes here, issued in nine, around 1918 was the first airmail flight anyway. So the stamp would have been around that time. And if you're a stamp collector at all, you've heard of the inverted Jenny. Um, this stamp design had a, a biplane in the center of it. And through an error of printing, 
a couple sheets of this stamp were, were sold to the public with the airplane upside down. Mm -hmm. And it became an extremely prized stamp. And uh, so on my quilt, there are upside down planes in the center and then all of the planes that radiate from it are right side up. And there are little clock face, uh, watch faces and coins also sewn to the quilt. And this was made for our uh, traveling exhibit called Time Squared. Uh, a takeoff on Times Square in New York, but everyone designed a quilt that had to do with either time or squares or Times Square itself. And my idea for this quilt was that when you do something in haste, you spend exponential amounts of time correcting your error. Um, and the, the layout of the, the quilt is um, very much copied from, from the actual stamp, the arc and the, the text of it. Uh, some of the lettering is stenciled, but the, the larger letters and numbers are uh, applique. Did the first airmail stamp sell for 24 cents? Yes, it was a 24 cent stamp. And in, um, in the early or in the 1918, 1919, I'm not terribly familiar with, you know, historical. Yeah. The first airmail flight was between Washington, D.C. and New York City in 1918. And this was the stamp that was issued for that. So it was pretty pricey for its time. That's what I'm thinking because a postcard right now is, you know, 30 something cents. So 24 cents a hundred years ago must have been a very significant investment to get us uh, something across across the ocean. But airplanes were still pretty special. So right. <laughs> there weren't the frequent flights that there are now. Yes, yes. Oh, very good. All right, so our next quilt, oh, I've got to zoom out a little bit more. Okay, so Beth, let's pass things back to you and tell us about this quilt here. Well, this is the third in a series of what I call my movement series, which is based on my love of dancing. And it was, it's very hard when you retire um, to sort and you've identified yourself of who you are. So I had avoided making literal dance quilts when I began, I did not want to do that. Um, I wanted to focus on movement. And so in this quilt, I start with a sketch of a line sketch of a dancer in some sort of gesture. And I play with that and I put it up on the wall and I add lines and take away. And in this, I took away most of the lines that were there so that you were really left with this image of, um, Oh, you can't see my little thing, which um, is this one dancer? Is this two dancers? Is this, um, you know, just what is it that you're seeing? The idea was to try and get the, the, the concept that um, one simple gesture of movement can set off a series of chain events. So as a dancer moves through the space and you have the curves, the quilting lines follow that. However, they're met with resistance. So when the, uh, if you were thinking in terms of the, the, the more diagonal part, you have resistance of the quilt line. So the quilt lines create the energy that the dancer creates. So not only are you seeing the visual where you can actually see the movement, you see the lines that the air creates around it. Mm -hmm. So that the quilting becomes a very important part of it and enriches the quilt. And um, I love doing it. Um, when you quilt this way, for those of you, well, most of us that you're watching, you're all quilters, you do get a huge distortion because I'm not thinking, keeping it square, I'm keeping it moving. So I have to work big to be able to cut down. <laughs> kind of make it a 40 inch, 40 inch square. So this one, this one was a challenge. So, um, and again, this is both my hand dies and I, I love doing it. It's just, um, and it's, you'll see on the, on the other quilt that's here, it's about this really trying to find the simple line. And my brain starts out, my brain starts out messy, you know, with lots of thoughts and lots of ideas. And it takes me a while to pare it down to kind of try to figure out what I'm actually saying or what the piece is saying. So. Beth, what, what do you quilt on? How do you quilt the, your pieces? 
Um, I quilted on the Juki. I used um, silk batting. I used as thin a batting as I can. Um, and just on a regular Juki. I started out on a tiny Bernina, but graduated. <laughs> just something with a little bigger throat so I can push the fabric through. Yeah. So, um, um, that, this is your this, non 40 by 40 piece, which um, I was just admiring in this piece this morning, actually, with some visitors. And we were saying that all of us would love to just take this piece to our own homes. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure it gets back to you, though. All right. Well, this one started with the fabric. So if you look at the blue and turquoise fabric and the black, um, I had taken fabric that I didn't like and over dyed it all with black. I just crunched it up and I got the most amazing piece of fabric and I, it, parts of it looked like x-rays. I mean, there was a lot of imagery going on. So I decided to try and use as much of it as I can as my, uh, those of you that know Paula Nadestrin would say it's my prima donna piece of fabric. Um, I started with that and then, built out. And if you look here at the squares, the brown squares, those are my ode to my first quilt, which was the log cabin that took me seven years mm -hmm. and sort of making it my own improvisational way and playing with it. And I also was exploring bringing the blue. So there's silk in here. There's some very fine silk of the, of the lines. Um, the piece became about log cabins are about home and family and the center being the the hearth you know the, the center of the home and so I was thinking in terms of looking in a window down into the log cabin but also being able to look out into the forest being looking out of the windows and that um as a dancer, and what I tried to teach my kids when I was teaching dance is to look at the world from different perspectives. So here you're looking in or you're looking out or around. And so, and um, I have to say, you know, when I started exhibiting these quilts, one of the comments that I used to get was that I didn't have right angle corners. And I wanna state that's on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I meant that. I really did. Well, thank you for noticing that. Exactly. And I do want to say something about my mom in that when I mentioned that, um, you know, she went to the Fashion Institute. The reason I didn't follow her footsteps into doing fabric, and I was thinking about Teresa, you're talking about patterns, any type of clothing that I made never fit. I got in home ec 100% on the making of it, but the fitting, not so much. So quilts, I could explore any way I want to. They do not have to fit any form. So that's my pieces. And if you want to, you can avoid curved seams. Oh. You don't have to. <laughs> well, the, you know what, the, the, the movement series is about curved pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, is about, because if this one mm -hmm. is one I worked on in the pandemic, so again, there's your window of looking in and out, but it's more of your Zoom window. And you know what it's like to have a dancer who doesn't have space to dance? If you've watched, I watched my friends trying to exercise or warm up or create, you were constantly trying to push out. So this was my, and it's all curved piecing. So I didn't get away from the curves. <laughs> and so that's, that's where I'm at. And it's such an honor to be at your museum. It really is. Oh, you. Yeah. Okay, Victoria, back to you, this beautiful piece of nature. Uh, yeah, this is, um, it's sort of a reoccurring theme in my work. And at this particular time, when we started talking about what, you know, what was this 40 by 40 going to look like? You know, my initial thought was, of course, to play with another double wedding ring. But what I really love about the Manhattan quilters is that by watching um, their work, 
has sort of evolve. And when we have meetings and we see things progress from each of these people whom I admire each of them greatly, they, they're constantly pushing me also as an artist to keep looking for more ways to express myself, maybe getting outside of my own box, which I'm always trying to do anyway. So I wanted to be able to work on something that um, was sort of in the back of my mind, something that I wanted to bring forward. I wanted to um, stick with layering, um, which is something I always love doing. And on my small pieces that I create, I'm always looking for a way to incorporate more handwork because often my quilts are very huge, which is why you have one on the bed behind you. <laughs> because this to me, uh, working on a smaller scale 40 by 40 is incredibly difficult for me to do because I just want to keep going and, you know, make it a statement. So containing um, all of the different thoughts and ideas that I had. And, and at the time when I was working on this, I was already thinking about in my work schedule that in two years from that date that I was going to take a year off of teaching and just be home, meaning I'd be able to have my hands in the dirt. I could be in the garden. I could be in my yard, you know, just looking for that moment to sort of reconnect with home and with nature. So that's kind of what inspired this piece. Um, I was also, uh, one of the things I'm always thinking about in my work is also light and, and how does it come through? Also the story, you know, what are the layers um, of thought, of the composition, the, you know, the visual impact. And I really wanted to see if I could um, incorporate a lot of, um, traditional aspects and modern aspects and make an art quilt because that's kind of what I try to do in all of my work whether I'm even if even if my quilts have a very uh, traditional aspect overall to them I'm looking for a way to push it to to all boundaries or characteristics of what a quilt could be so in this case you um, know playing with a shape and how it joins together in different proportions, appliquing all the little ovals, finding this great sort of dyed fabric um, to help incorporate the different layers of getting that sort of the, the lightness that comes through the trees and, and the darker values on top, some getting giving you some detail, um, giving you some silhouette, um, hand quilting the lines, the movement, just trying to incorporate as much of the different techniques that I like to incorporate in all of my quilts doesn't always happen. The hand quilting aspect doesn't always happen on my large quilts because I don't just don't have the time to do that. But I am visually trying to add as many layers as I can mm -hmm. um, on each of my pieces. This particular quilt though, as I was thinking about taking that time off from teaching was sort of to you know give my brain some space to sort of relax and sort of focus more on my art quilts as well and it made me think of a time when my daughter who's now 21 but went back when she was like two and a half I had picked her up from preschool one day and and she was a pretty happy giddy kid and she was kind of incredibly quiet on this walk home and I was like you know what's the matter you know what are you thinking about and she was really she kind of sighed and she's like mom she says just look to the trees and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I actually call this one look to the trees because I thought it, it also really kind of struck home for me about, you know, sort of that stop and smell the roses, just like take a moment to, you know, take in what's around you. And I, I thought that was pretty astute of her to come up with that. But I uh, thought that was a good place as a goal to look forward to um, when I was gonna be able to have time. And of course, COVID, certainly kept us all home to have a little bit more time at home. So that's that's been interesting, but it, it actually has been a real blessing uh, to be able to be home and to focus on the work that I'm doing now. And when you had asked for the second quilt, this the next quilt I wanted to show you is the, the quilt that's on the bed behind you, is uh, incidental noise, <laughs> which, the term, I was on a, uh, one of the many flights flying back and forth from teaching from wherever, and 
the show was in subtitles and when there was like noise going on in the background it just said incidental noise in the background <laughs> and i love that i was like that's an amazing title for a quilt this is a quilt that i had been working on for a long time again there's lots of it's a it's a simple traditional pattern but the fabrics and the layering and the color kind of have the same impact as the the tree quilt with the light coming through and uh, the different angles and the movement of the stripes and and then again the shapes of the circular patterns that were going on and and I thought that really kind of summed up a lot of that noise that kind of goes on in your head and you're trying to sift through it all to kind of find that zen that calmness that hang out and look to the trees sort of a vibe and I had just been finishing this up early in quarantine and so I thought it made a really nice comparison to you know, work that I did two years ago and to the work that I was doing now. And I also like the fact that this lends itself to more of a traditional aspect of the work that I do, but, um, you know, just kind of showing the different layers in two different forms of quilts. So whether it's something that's very art related or even more of a traditional aspect, this still has a very art quality just by the layering of the color. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I got. And it still rings. It's not a double wedding ring, but that whole circular pattern on top of a of a grid is something that's just really interesting to me uh, visually. Yeah. So let me pose this question to you. I've heard you refer to the Manhattan Quilt Guild as a critique group. Um, and Victoria, I think you alluded that just a little bit earlier, but um, Tell us more about specifically what that means. What does a meeting of the Manhattan Quilters Guild look like or sound like or feel like? Um, go ahead. Yeah, anybody, go oh, ahead. All right. Um, what it is is we, we come together in a room and we bring the work that we're, we're working on or a piece that we finished. And we go around the table and people share what they're doing. Um, what I love about this critique group is if you want input, the input is there. If you're showing a piece that you don't want input and you're just sharing, people will comment on it, but you're not getting critiqued on it, if that makes sense to you. So, and the critique that does happen is it's very supportive and very kind and very honest about what people see. So it's the, it's a real safe place to bring your work and to share your work. And that is something that's very rare. And I think you could tell from the three of us that we all approach our quilting and our design thoughts in a totally different way. And like Victoria was saying, I have such respect for each of the members because they do come at it from a different way. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet we're all artists. And so when you critique, you're still critiquing the concept of composition, the concept of color. Um, so that you do, I don't know, you just walk in there and you're inspired. Uh, when you are frustrated, you, you get help, you know, and it's, it's just a great place to, to be. I've been in it since 2005. So I can imagine that even if your work isn't necessarily on the receiving end of critique, that providing critique to others um, can also give you value as an artist to help you look at things a different way or, um, yeah, I suppose just expand your ideas about things. So it, it just sounds like a really wonderful group to be a part of. But that is, I think that's important, Beth, you say that the critique comes in a very safe but honest way, um, dishonest feedback isn't helpful, but right. providing feedback in a safe and helpful way is, it, it can be a challenge. There's also I mean, a really strong passion of each of the people that's in the group. You know, we're all very dedicated to what we do. We're all exhibiting artists. Mm -hmm. And I think that really comes through and to be able to have that sort of community within the quilting community, and for what we do, um, it's it's uh, it's just a really a nice extra layer to how I work, how they work, how we work together, and it's just it's just a really exciting environment. Sometimes it leads to a discussion of 
a different technique or how did you do that? Or did you try it this way? Or let's look at it upside down or, you know, different people because of their unique perspective will have different suggestions about how it might proceed if you're stuck on something and you can take it or leave it, but it's there. And it also gives you uh, more, what's the word I want more, well, for lack of a better word, experience at talking about your work. Sure. Because initially right. when you join the group, maybe you, maybe you know some of the members, maybe you don't, but over time you come to know them and you become more relaxed speaking about your work. And it's not so intimidating when you're called upon to speak about it. Sometimes people feel initially, well, my quilt should say it all. You shouldn't have to hear from me. <laughs> you know, you should look at it and take away from it whatever you want to. But people want to know why you did what you did the way you did it. And meeting in this group on a regular basis gives you um, the opportunity to maybe articulate something that you never really thought about because it was all in your own head. But when you're put on the spot to explain to somebody, you realize why you did something and you become more at ease speaking about how you do your work. I think that's a really good point, Teresa. You know, there's there's a certain way of thinking about art that it should just be the interpretation of the viewer, um, and and music is far more my art form than visual art. Um, and the listener for music has their own interpretation of it, um, but it's also very informative um, to know what the composer or what the artist or what mm -hmm. the dancer is thinking. Um, you know, as they're creating you know, any kind of performance or visual art that can really give you insight into, into your interpretation of it as well. So those of you who are on Zoom with us, if you've got other questions, you feel free to stick those in the chat window. I am watching that. Um, but I have this other question for you. Um, so how, how does somebody who has come to quilting um, from a very traditional aspect um, you know, does traditional patchwork, mostly follows patterns, that kind of thing. Do you have advice for somebody who is like that, but is thinking, gosh, I really, I really feel like some more improvisational piecing or improvisational quilting is calling to me, but I just don't really know how to start. What's an entree point there? Curiosity. You got to have the curiosity to go after it. And if that's, if there's another technique or something that you want to learn, there's a plethora of places for you to do that. But the, the sort of the willingness to jump in and explore um, is the thing that's going to take you to another level. I think also the um, search for perfection should be thrown out the window. Highly the fear of the fear of going forward should be thrown out. I mean, I have some friends that are sitting there listening right now who know that I like took a class and I've taken a class and I'll put something up on the wall and not like it and cut it and not like it and cut it. And there is just keep going until you get to what you want to get to. Um, and, you know, I, that's, I think that's the biggest thing that holds us back sometimes is just the fear. Mm. I mean, I started doing hand dyes because I would spend so much money on commercial fabric, I would be afraid to cut it. <laughs> and somehow or other, you know, I didn't add up how much the supplies cost, but I figured, oh, I got this, you know, from ten, three dollars a yard. This is great. Not, you know, so I wasn't, you know, you so see, you get rid of the fear. Nothing has to be perfect. And it's just fabric. I've You're precious. The fabric's not precious. Cut that stuff up. <laughs> Yeah, like with favorite fabrics, right? Like it's my favorite fabric. I don't want to always more. There's always more favorite fabric. <laughs> it never changes. And Victoria, am I correct that let's see from your last exhibit with us that you had a quilt top and it was away in the closet and then you took it out and you literally just cut it into pieces and made a whole it, quilt it top. made it into three different quilt tops. Actually, it was the third time I cut it up that I finally got the results that I wanted out of it. It's, it's fabric. And just because you've made something as a quilt top, that doesn't have to be the end of the line to it. Just because somebody says that it is, it can be your own language, not everybody else's language. It's your fabric, you paid for it, cut that stuff up. If you're not happy with it, that's your curiosity right there going, I need to do something else to it. What can I bring to the table? How can you add something to it? But you have to cut it, you have to cut so, it. 
So we've got some questions. Oh, no, go ahead, Beth. No, I was just going to follow up with something that Victoria said in, in that it's also, there are so many teachers out there and there's so many, um, if you don't, and, and what I did was I studied with every teacher I could honing my skills in. And then I got to the point where I needed to go further and somebody had like suggested like someone like Nancy Crow. There are also other teachers out there that teach you the beginning of looking at composition mm -hmm. and how to approach it that way. So that, that you know, art books, looking at art. In defense of being afraid to cut it up, there's one thing I would like to say on that subject. Um, because I work with a lot of vintage materials that are irreplaceable, you know, a one of a kind something, I tend to make a full scale pattern or a half scale pattern or work on graph paper to get an idea of how I want to use that special fabric before I get started. Uh, because if I cut incorrectly, I can't get more of it or I can't, I try to preserve that vintage fabric uh, that commemorative fabric as it is. A lot of times I don't quilt through it because it's weaker, it's older, um, and I don't want to disturb what it was um, originally. But I, I'm, um, I admire a great deal how much improvisation other members of the group do. And when I try to do it, it doesn't work for me because I'm so used to being a pattern maker. Um, I try to leave some part of the design to improv because otherwise it's just work. If you work out every detail when you make the pattern, then you're left with just work to make it. You want some of that excitement of making decisions as you go along. But I do tend to have a plan when I start and I can always throw it away any time, but um, I do wanna have some idea what I'm gonna do before I get started. And I also hate ripping and I hate <laughs> saying to myself, oh, I wish I had done blah, 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 you know, so right. it's, it's good to have some idea of what you're going to do. But you started with a question about how would you transition from being yeah. um, a more traditional quilter? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think when, when a lot of us started, we were very traditional. And it only took me that one hexagon quilt and one of rectangles to say, this is way too much work to do something that's been done hundreds of times, if not thousands of times before by somebody who did it better than me, rather than invest time in doing that pattern again, I wanna do something that's uniquely my own and just find a little segue to changing it. And uh, before you, you know it, you're doing what you wanna do and not what a traditional pattern was. Even if it's just the way you color a traditional pattern, maybe not making all the repeat blocks the same, instead of you know a quilt that's very symmetric, all these blocks being the same, start taking some chances. And before you join them together, you can always change your mind. Exactly. The so easy place to start is by taking one shape within a traditional pattern and trying something different, whether you're cutting up a different kind of fabric or if you're dropping in a different shape within a quilt, you know that's an easy place to start boosting your curiosity on how you're looking at quilt tops and how you're putting them together. Okay, I'll have to give some thought to that myself. So Karen is wondering um, about joining, how you all came to be in the Manhattan Quilters Guild. Is there an audition or a selection process? Is there an expectation that you're already an exhibiting artist? Um, I know you expressed that your goal is to keep the group small and I can understand why hearing about your critique process that that would be more valuable with a smaller group. Um, it's changed a lot over time. <clears throat> um, we've, I think we've all come in on, on, in different ways. You know, for me, I was invited to apply. Okay. Someone had seen my work at, at a quilt show and invited me to apply. And I got this huge application. I had to fill out what I did as community service and, you know, a resume and where I'd exhibit. Um, other people like Victoria. I was invited and I was invited to come to one meeting and show my work. And then I think there was a follow up after the fact. I was incredibly nervous. Thank you very much. <laughs> These women are amazing. <laughs> and I thought, I don't need, I don't deserve to be here. 
So it was, it was, it's great. It was a lovely honor. Thank you. For, now, for many, many years, members weren't added because there was the right number for the place where they met. Mm -hmm. And at, at one point in, um, I joined in 91, there were, I think, six members. I could be wrong, but I think six members came in at that time because some people had dropped out. Mm -hmm. And over time, there became this very formal process of submitting slides and people voting. And that didn't always work. And um, after a while, it became more knowing somebody who felt like you would be a good fit to the group. And in recent years, because of uh, Zoom, well, clearly through the pandemic, we've proven that through Zoom, being away from each other physically doesn't mean you have to leave the group. We have members who live out of state, out of country, and because of Zoom are still able to participate. So there isn't the attrition from the group that there used to be when people moved away. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, and did you say if somebody did leave, that's when we have a space and we look for somebody? Decades ago, yes, that was true. You know. Either through through work or moving that they just couldn't participate anymore. Um, but uh, we have tried to keep the number around 2025. So Victoria, this is for you specifically. How do you select colors? And I'm sure you could talk about this for hours, but um, the is it willy-nilly, which I know is not true? Color wheel, trial and error? Oh, willy-nilly has a big part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not thinking about the color wheel. I'm not thinking, oh, I have a lot of red, so now I need to put a lot of yellow in. That's Even though I'm trained as a painter and a fine artist, I have that knowledge, but that's not what I'm looking for when I'm pulling fabric off my shelves. I'm looking for whatever catches my eye. I'm looking for other fabrics that can help tell the story that I want to tell. Um, looking for um, just a, oftentimes a color palette that I haven't maybe used before, trying to push myself, use colors that I say I don't like or don't use very often or find challenging or whatever. So there's been sort of a rash of green quilts lately because that's kind of where I'm at. I even wearing it, crying out loud. Um, and, you know, now I'm kind of switching a little bit to some things I'm working on are a little bit darker, you know, and, and looking for more ways to uh, just push the limits constantly. Beth, here's a question for you. Do you enjoy quilting to convey the physical movement of dancing or the feelings that dancing creates, if either, or both? I would say both. I would say both because the feeling of moving through space, I'm uh, not moving through space. <laughs> I'm retired, the body doesn't work that way, but I remember the feeling. And the feeling of moving through space is what I do try to project in, in, in what I'm doing. Um, so it's, and it's how I feel when, you, when you're dancing and when you, when I was dancing, there's a sense of freedom and when I'm, quilting and I'm doing those quilt lines, I'm feeling that feeling, that sense that my body no longer does it, but my brain does it. And I remember that feeling. So I've never thought about it. So whoever asked that question, thank you. But yeah, I do do both. So so that was a, a private message to me from, I don't think she would mind me sharing, from Jessica, who is a lovely quilter here in, um, in Iowa, actually. Well, thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Can you think that, you know, there is. And there's, Miranda is a fellow dance teacher and has loved hearing you speak about that. And Mary Jones, I just have to read this comment. Um, she says, thank you so much, inspiring questions and answers. On the topic of changing from garment making to quilting, she heard Blanche Young say, the bed don't care if the quilt don't fit. And the comment changed her direction forever. <laughs> okay, I'm there with you. <laughs> I'm there. It doesn't even care if it's flat. <laughs> true, true. Very, very. So thank you. You guys are great. Well, I agree with some of the comments, which are lovely, by the way. I always love reading your comments, everybody, that it is nice to be um, joined with you again this morning, Beth, and or this afternoon, Beth and Victoria and Teresa. Um, it's lovely to be looking at your quilts. I can look out and see almost all of them as I sit here and look at you. And 
If you are able to make it to Winterset, Iowa between now and August 29th, you will not be disappointed. I can promise you that. Um, we are open seven days a week, 10 to 5, Monday through Saturday, and 12 to 4 on Sundays. We have two fantastic quilt shops within steps of us, and there are several others within the state. So if you're you know, on a road trip, you will find lots. In fact, um, Iowa has the most quilt shops per capita of any other state in the country. <laughs> you're really trying to get us all out there. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get to Iowa. <laughs> yes, and it's just a three hour drive, I think, from here to Lincoln, Nebraska where you could see the International Quilt Studies, well, it's not Study Center, International Quilt Museum. Um, so it's definitely worth a trip to the Midwest if you're not from here. Now, somebody joined us from Santiago, Chile. I'm not sure if she'll be able to make a trip to the Midwest, but if she wants to fly in, you know, the Des Moines Airport is really just 35 minutes from here. And um, I'm sure you can connect to Des Moines somewhere from Santiago, Chile. Um, Teresa, Victoria, Beth, anything else before we wrap up? Thank you. We're just all so thrilled. Thank you. We're so glad you sent pictures. The installation looks beautiful. <laughs> Almost like we're there. Almost like you're there, yes. Well, we are so happy um, to do that. You know, from a museum standpoint, it's important to us that we show the history of quilting and this, this traditional art form and how it has come to be in this 21st century. But we also find it very important to show that this is not a dead and gone art form and that it is living and well in lots of different forms. Um, and obviously there are traditional quilts still being made and lots and lots of them, but this is um, a very big part of the quilting world right now. And so it's important to us to, to showcase that as well from the standpoint of telling the story of what is quilting as an art form. So thank you so much for joining us today, for taking your time to be on Zoom with us. And, Hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Just to remind you, if you know somebody who wasn't able to log on today, we will have the recording available on our website, which is really easy, iowaquiltmuseum.org. Oops, org. And there is our website there. You can also find a way there to make a supporting donation to the, web, to the Iowa Quilt Museum. You can shop our online store. You can become an annual member. And you can sign up for our email list and find out about future exhibits. The next exhibit of ours uh, that opens in late August will feature the quilts and textile study of Mary Barton. And then over the winter, we're doing an exhibit, um, a study of the color orange titled Here Comes the Sun. And in early 2022, we will be the concluding um, location for the exhibit of Deeds Not Words, the women's suffrage exhibit that has been traveling for the last three years, I think. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you again. We'll be online again um, July 27th, which is the fourth Tuesday of July with three more artists from the Manhattan Quilt Guild. And then once more on August 24th. And we have lectures scheduled with Paula Nadelstern and Meg Cox um, later throughout this exhibit. So you're definitely going to want to get signed up on our email list or follow us on Facebook so you can find out about that information as well. All right. Thanks Thank again. You, so Megan. Much, Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Good to see you. for being online with us. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.